called for looking at not just transportation but also land use and because those costs are intimately tied together. Um, but we want to enhance our existing bus transit and move towards, uh, well, just as an example, um, there's some simple things you can do. And I'm sure that Joel might chime in here, but we just need to really uh, move forward with our transit plan to, um, I think we were supposed to quadruple it with really in the next few years and move towards more enhanced um, uh, express buses and things like that that could actually go through or, or the downtown areas. But <coughs> again, you're stuck with uh, how do you get people to even the bus stations and things. So uh, maybe we've got a, a working solution on that. Of course, we can have more feeder buses and things like that, but uh, this concept that you all are talking about uh, would be very interesting. Um, Anyway, I, I don't have any more to add. I just wish that I had this final document to present, but we will present that at some point in the near future. I've got some, uh, if you want, I've got these blow-ups in the north and south to give you a little better look at the routing. Those, those routes are fairly well set, would you say, with the three alternatives, Paul? Um, yes. Um, there were some uh, later revisions of the, the new location. Um, and you got to remember too that that is touching on this karst area and things like that. So yeah. that, and it's also not really going through the downtown. So, so yeah. uh, there's some very, and it's also the most expensive. Thing, so right. we might be looking more closely at the other two alternatives, especially the commuter rail. And I should like to add that the um, uh, Arkansas Missouri Railroad com Company has been very cooperative in this. Really? Way. Yeah, a lot of that doesn't always happen of course no. I know that. Yeah. But, uh, but they do an excursion train and so they're familiar with working with people and so they're not totally opposed to them um, but they would be the operators uh, with such a system in the future um, the problem though is I should explain that the reason that the engineering firm did not recommend putting a light rail next to it is through both technical and uh, Federal Railroad Administration rules that said that you can't do that because it's not crash worthy. You have to have what they call temporal separation between the only go in the daytime and the freight go at night. But this is a very active freight line. It's very successful actually. And uh, so that wouldn't be feasible. Um, plus you have overhead electric lines and things like that that wouldn't technically work. So uh, we'd have to use the uh, uh, commuter rail option. But those are actually evolving uh, into what they call diesel electric uh, modes that are much more efficient and uh, uh, sort of merging yeah. with the whole light rail sort of approach. So that's a, a good option. So you said the temporal separation. You mean these kind again? Well, that just means that um, you don't want <coughs> freight trains running into uh, passenger cars. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so what you have to do is just have the freight. Yeah at night and then the daytime would have the okay. passenger. So that they can live with that restriction then? Uh, no. According to the engineering report, uh, you probably couldn't get that because uh, they have many customers to serve mm -hmm. during the day. Uh, so that what that would mean that you would have to build the more uh, uh, passing lanes. Oh, you'd have to have two sets of trucks. Yeah. yeah. Okay. For a good part. Okay. San Diego operates or later, uh, red cars much like that where the freight is done at night on the same tracks but uh, the challenge for Arkansas and Missouri because of the number of trains they run. Right. Okay. Um, well I've got a little graphic here about the cost per mile and you can see there's a huge difference between heavy light and, and, and bus rapid transit. Um, these are not obviously exact numbers in every case, but that, that gives you a kind of a quarter of magnitude difference in the cost. Now, is that the active cost, like the operating cost, or is that the... That's the cost to put in place. Put in place, yeah. Mm -hmm. Does that include the, the right-of-way cost? Uh, Are you anticipating that that <coughs> new right-of-way for all for the, for the three? I think it probably does. It does probably... Take into consideration, you know, you have 
have to require a new right away. Yeah. With the BRT, the, the, the presumption is that you're going on existing road roadways, I believe. Uh, very interesting. The uh, new transportation authorization that's being proposed, uh, they want to greatly increase the BRT funding. Yeah. Um, so that's an option too. Yeah. So a big a big issue, obviously, that you talked about is is how do you get that last mile conundrum? How do you connect? <coughs> I mean, transit's great if you if you're close to it, but if you live a mile or two away, you still got to get in a car or you got to get on the bus. Some, you, somehow you got to get there in order to have a high utilization rate, and that's critical to the success, to the, to the economic viability and everything. If you want to get roads, cars off the road, you have to have high utilization rates. So um, that's what, what you mentioned, and I'm sure that's right, and that that would really help our ridership numbers if we had such a system. Yeah. You also need to be careful with doing the airport up front, Oakland, LA, Portland, a lot of them didn't include the airport mm -hmm. in their initial, and it becomes much more problematic mm -hmm. later. Right. right. Yeah, it would be nice to have a spur line or something in there. Yeah. Or maybe it's a, maybe you do a BRT that's separate over there. Huh? Well, we did have a mm -hmm. connector, uh, conceptual con uh, connector to that. Yeah. Yeah. So this is one way that, that, that they handled it in uh, Berlin. They actually bought a bunch of these cars. And, and uh, you know, I guess it works well in a, in a compact European city like that. But uh, I, I guess I, I'd go ahead and turn this over to, to Lee, if you want to speak to this, Lee. Sure. Um, Michelle Hallsville at the University of Arkansas Walton School of Business and um, Sustainability. <coughs> Life Sustainability Center, Sustainability Center um, has been working on the STAR Community Rating System. And the STAR Community Rating System is like, um, it's, it's like LEED for buildings, only you're rating the community in um, seven or eight different categories, such as the built environment, natural systems, economy and jobs, equity and empowerment. Um, STAR stands for Sustainability Tools for Assessing Rating Communities. So the, the idea is that you can take a city, a large city, a small city, um, go through all these metrics and outcomes in a very um, quantifiable way and come up with a point system to where you can be rated a three-star community, a four-star community, a five-star community. Um, it kicked off a couple of years ago. Um, Fayetteville as a community is actually in what they in like the second year of, of the program, so there is a handful of cities that have already been rated. Um, it rates the whole community, and so um, the metrics come from um, census data, you know, data sources that, that can be applied across the U.S. Um, so you're you're looking at stuff from you know the health department from Beaver Water District, from the City of Fayetteville Recycling Department, from Seven Hills Homeless Shelter, from the Chamber of Commerce, all these different entities that make up our community put inputs into this rating system. Um, you're graded and then you you get a rating. Um, so Michelle Halsell has been putting this together. Um, we anticipate. She's been working on it for about a year. We anticipate that we will submit um, probably in June, and it'll take it'll take a couple months for yeah, the this month to go yeah, yeah to go through all the um, the metrics and, and rate us, and then they will get back with us on it. So um, it's really an exciting um, opportunity for the city of Fayetteville to participate in this. We're one of a handful of cities in that second cohort. Um, you can go onto the website and it's, it's very deep, um, a very deep analysis. Um, and so it takes a lot of time to put all the, all the metrics together um, to do it. I think it's a great program to be involved in. See some of the other organizations that were involved in getting it started and there's a list listed as a supporter. Yeah, actually, um, John Coleman, um, when he was the sustainability director of the city of Fayetteville, um, we worked with STAR um, to develop the metrics that then, they then used. Um, there's a little more about it. Yeah, there's, a, there's the categories that are on the right, the built environment, the climate, 
So they don't have one specifically for transportation, but they do have, um, what do they have? They have, where would that fit in? Kind of it would fit into the built environment. <coughs> they, they really took a, an approach where transportation was very much integrated with land use, which is the way it should be. Mm -hmm. As Paul talked about earlier, you, you can't separate transportation from land use. Right. Um, transportation needs to be context sensitive to the existing or the future land use of a place. Right. Um, so it falls in the built environment piece. Right. The built environment has your infill pieces, your anti-crawl pieces, your transportation pieces, right. urban form. Yeah, well, just to, to mention something about that, the um, over the last 10 years or so, uh, there's been a tremendous reversal in uh, development patterns in the, in the U.S. away from sprawl, back towards itself. And uh, when, when the sort of real estate meltdown happened back in 2008, I guess, uh, the, the places where the real estate was hurt the worst was the suburbs. And, and they've they bounced back slower, and the places that have been more resilient have been the in town location. And with the, the obvious preference for most young people to live in town now, that's doesn't seem to be just a you know a, a blip in the radar. I mean, I think that's been a, a big change in, in the 21st century. So the the really the neat thing about this is it's so inclusive. I mean, it's you've got educational attainment, so it's it's information you're getting from the school district. What's your graduation rate? It's information that you get from. The um, the election commission. What's the what's the increase in participation in elections over the last four election cycles? Um, so it's very quantifiable. It's meant to to go across the board. So in the city, I think the smallest city that that is participating is um, Nederland, Colorado, which is six thousand people maybe. Yeah. Um, very small town. Um, but you've had large cities like Phoenix is in our cohort this time. So um, it, it's a very um, it's very deep. You get down in the in the weeds in, in that thing um, in all those metrics and some some stuff you just you're just not going to do well with um, a living wage. You know, does the city have a living wage ordinance? Does the city have you know? Um, something else or is the or do you have a community group that, that does this? So it, it is it's much bigger than the city as an entity. It, it really is a community rating. Right. Yeah. <coughs> I guess Mike, this is your cue. Do you have anything you'd like to add to about the university? Well, one of our challenges is we don't do a very good job of uh, advertising accomplishments. We take on challenges, we do a pretty good job of overcoming them and then we take a deep breath and move on to the next. And I think the university in the last 10-15 uh, years has done a number of things that we all need to be proud of. Um, across the broader thing of sustainability, and we've been recycling since 1992. Um, we uh, designated LEED certified in 2004 for new buildings and major renovation. We upped that to LEED and added green globes, two globes as our standards for in 2006. We have two, just recently we have two gold certified builder, gold designated buildings out of LEED. We have two buildings on campus that were uh, ran through the uh, green globes process, a one globe and a two globe. Um, just found out that the Fred W. Smith uh, Football Operations Center got LEED silver as of March of this year. So it's into athletics, they're part of the program. Um, we were a charter signatory of the American College and University President's Climate Commitment, OCUPUC. <laughs> love, love, love our uh, acronyms. Uh, in 2007, uh, hired our first director, full-time director of sustainability in 2008, submitted our first climate action plan in 2009. Climate Action Plan commits us to being climate neutral by 2040. That may sound like not a big thing, but when two-thirds of your footprint comes from how you generate your electricity and the natural gas to heat the, the campus, it's a big challenge because our power source, which is 
SWEPCO, which is the American Electric Power, is in that grid that has, I think it's over 90%, is coal. Mm -hmm. And um, we have some control over that. We're one of their larger users for SWEPCO. But we're doing some things internally that should uh, help them. I think our largest footprint was in about 11, and it was in the 180,000 net metric ton equivalents of greenhouse gas emitted on campus. Again, about two thirds of that is from our electric power that we consume, chilled, uh, chilled water, cooling, heating, natural gas. But um, our goal by 2021 is to have that to 120,000. That is about our level in 1990, which ties into Kyoto. Since 1990, the campus is totally different as far as students, square footage, energy conservation, attitude, green, etc. That's a huge accomplishment. We think we'll be there next year, 2015. We're putting in cogeneration, gas turbines, unfired. Uh, Pressure vessel heating on the exhaust. Uh, we're, all of our old boilers will be gone. We'll have 10 natural gas quick reaction boilers. The old boilers, you had to have one standby firing without producing anything while you were producing off another because if you had a problem, you didn't have time to go through the whole sequence. These new boilers, you turn them on and they're up to heat, up to speed. So we can run our, our gas turbine and generate 25% base electric power on campus. Uh, our worst consumption is about 22 megawatts when we're running air conditioning in August and September. Uh, this gas turbine is five megawatts. We're gonna generate, on the average, about 25% of our power on campus, natural gas. So that will allow us to take a significant amount of our greenhouse gas emissions off the table. Uh, we've spent $35 million in energy savings performance contracts, um, working on over 4 million square feet of buildings, lights, water, uh, heating, ventilation, air conditioning, control systems. Uh, we've got cisterns, geothermal power for the, uh, the new Gene Tyson Child Development Study Center. Uh, it's geothermal. It just received its gold lead. The nanoscale material science building, <coughs> which came online about three years ago, most complex building we've ever built. Research, lead gold, our first lead gold building. Uh, so there's some great stories in that. Focusing in on transportation, which is today's topic, um, we published our first transportation master plan in 2005. In that, there were some policies and procedures, transportation demand management uh, guidelines, we were a little slow on pulling the trigger on getting those policies officially adopted. Well, a lot has changed. We are under contract and we're doing a transportation master plan update <coughs> as we speak. Uh, one of the city uh, planners was on our committee. In fact, Peter was on our committee. We have one of our planners on the city committee. We're gonna share data, share data collection. We have a little different focus than the city but we're inextricably linked to the city because we're surrounded by the city and we are a contributor to the city by doing that. So we're gonna work them together and see if we can accomplish goals for both parties when we come out. Razorback Transit, and Adam can talk more of this, but Razorback Transit, over two million passengers transported. Uh, probably 250,000 to 275,000 of those are non-university affiliates. So, again, there's a city connection along with what we do. We want to get our students to campus from concentration. So ours is more of a hub and spoke, and it's, and it's getting tied better and better into Ozark. We've been working with Ozark for years, whether you believe it or not. <laughs> <laughs> and it is getting better. And you see them up at the, uh, in the mall, Lot 56 is a main interchange point. Um, and I think that's only going to improve as they expand on their route system and go in that direction. We're hoping to have our update, uh, transportation master plan update done in the next six to eight months at most, and that'll hopefully tie in fairly well with the city's <laughs> master plan, transportation master plan update. Um, our focus is pedestrian and transit, uh, <coughs> and wrapped around both of those is safety. 
So a lot of our streets and a lot of our uh, crosswalks are focused on pedestrians. Um, that impacts vehicle flow, uh, which drives people to avoid, like Garland and Maple, uh, mm -hmm. where the students have the priority on that. So they start <laughs> taking other routes, and that creates neighborhood challenges. So in the town and gown, as we've, uh, that last couple of years, with that town and gown committee, with uh, university representation, city representation, and neighborhood representation. Uh, we're kind of working a transition zone around the entire campus that stretches out further in those neighborhoods. I think that's been a great tool as well. It, it has a, an older person on that uh, group. It has uh, students on that group. Uh, I think it's staff on both sides. I think that's a, it's been a great forum this past couple of years. Um, the Garland Center. That complex with the retail and the bookstore and the parking garage. That garage was designed and came online about three years ago or so. When it becomes financially viable, that upper level is designed for a solar array to go up on top of the columns. There are somewhere in the neighborhood of 35 spaces in that garage that have plumbing to run electric wires for electric vehicle charging two parking spaces, doesn't sound like much, have had electric vehicle charging stations in them for about three to four years now since it opened. Uh, you have to have a parking permit, we don't charge you for the charge. There's a challenge there because you come in and park for the day, you're taking up the space, you're plugged for the day, so we've got some things to work on. So there's opportunities there, but with the cost of our electricity in that six plus range, six cents kilowatt hour range, it's not like California where it's 12 to 15 and a lot of things pencil out for a return on investment. We're working hard to keep tuition down, keep graduating debt down, so it's very difficult for us to invest in things that don't have some type of a reasonable return. We are investing a lot that reduces our greenhouse gas uh, footprint. Uh, we've committed to becoming climate neutral by 2040. Uh, the next 20 years, the second part of that program, we're updating our climate action plan. We've accomplished most of the first five years. Um, it's going to be much more challenging on how we get to climate neutral. Uh, we're working with the city on trying to up the game in recycling. Uh, their 80% uh, diverting from the landfill is a, is a huge challenge, but it's the right challenge, and we want to be part of that because I think there's some synergy between the two of us on pre- and post-consumer composting. Uh, we are now in our new construction, we're recycling somewhere north of 80 to 90 percent of demolition and construction debris. We're tracking, that's part of lead. We've got the data. Um, so there's a lot of things happening on that side. Just a couple comments when Paul was talking on, on transit and light rail. Can't stress how much zoning and creating the density <coughs> to put in light rail, even if it's 10 or 15 or 20 years from now, if we don't start the rezoning and creating the density now, we aren't going to support it. We can mimic some of that with express buses and feed the future stations. You start getting people used to it. You start getting people comfortable that they can depend on the timing and that sort of thing. But our land away from our corridor is pretty economical, and it makes it easy to sprawl. One of the things we've, we've done as a university in the last 10 years is trying to contain our sprawl into the neighborhood, increase our density, increase our utilization of our existing facilities, and not move into the neighborhoods, but go up and try to create more green at the same time, which is a balancing act. So, yeah, that, I, I think that's a great point. I, I uh, had the good fortune of participating in a design charade in Atlanta about three months ago for a transit-oriented development project with MARTA. And that's one of the things that they're wrestling with is, is how do you, um, they have a, a, this area of town called Brookhaven, and it's basically, it's a, it's, it's a suburb, if you're familiar with Atlanta, Atlanta geographically, it's only about 700,000 people that live in the city of Atlanta, and then there's about 4 million people that live in the suburbs. And this Brookhaven is right outside the, the city limits, and it feels like they're in the city, but uh, they're trying to read 
develop that whole area around around the MARTA station. And so we looked at a bunch of different transportation alternatives and, and developed densities. And that's, that's that's all very important. I think. And uh, one of the things that we actually were trying to do there was was the reason why they invited me is because my my uh, sort of study of electric electrics. And they're going to try to, to use less electric as a feeder system there for for their station. At least one that's one of the ideas. I have to take a commercial break now. So you kind of remind me. We have a tradition here with Pat the Hat. We are a <laughs> nonprofit, and if you'd like to pitch in a dollar fifty cents or whatever you want. We're, we're volunteers. Yes. Okay. Well, one, thing, one thing I'll mention: LSEVs. We have now for for the fall four designated LSEV spaces. On campus, the science engineering building, Gary Smith, and parking and transit. Pull those out. So there's four spaces for those vehicles to come and go from campus. They don't charge there or anything like that as far as plugging in. But at least we're, we're looking at tools. The other thing you touched on, four or five years ago, we had less than 100 scooters. We're probably approaching 1,500 scooters. So we've created not only bicycle parking, and motorcycle parking and vehicle parking, we now have bicycle, scooter, motorcycle, mm -hmm. vehicle parking, and it just continues to grow. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, well, thank you, Mike. Uh, I guess before we get into this, I should give uh, you two guys from Mozart Police uh, Transit an opportunity to say anything you want to, or um, if you guys want to, or just want to kind of roll, roll. Well. I'll just uh, spot off for a little bit here. Um, well, I, I know it's our big friends, but in my mind, uh, we've only been around for 18 months. Uh, I got here 18 months ago, Jeff got here a year ago, and the focus that we've been working towards, first of all, relationships within the community, that has been a huge uphill battle for us to, to reestablish Ozark Regional Transit in the community as an opportunity for people to use transit-related services. Uh, when I first got here, everything that I could tell it was built for um, the homeless people without. I mean, it was, it was if you don't have anywhere else to go or any way where else to use uh, public transit or, or a, a way to get around town, both our three regional transit will give you a pass and you can go ahead and use that. Um, in my mind, transit is not uh, for just the homeless and the needy and those that have not. Um, that's the low hanging fruit. Uh, Ozark Regional Transit is for everybody in this room. Respect Transit is for everybody in this room. If you want to get from one side of town to another side of town without losing A, your parking spot, uh, B, spending 20 minutes looking for the parking spot when you get back, why don't you start taking a look at transit? And I would ask everybody in this room, if, if everybody in this room is really working towards a green sustainable future for Northwest Arkansas, how many of you have actually used either Race Back or Ozark Regional Transit? That's not here today. Less than half. Less than half of the people in here have used it once before. I mean that's that is that is something that I would challenge each and every one of you 